you, you can you can do that yeah may it please the court <laughs> my name is josh and i am the president of the harlan institute and i am so happy to welcome you to match number six of the Consors Harlan Institute Virtual Supreme Court Competition. Uh, this is our final round, which will determine, uh, sorry, our final match in the round, which will determine who advances to the championship in Washington, D.C. next month. Uh, we are joined today by two teams from Lake Oswego High School in Oregon. Uh, the petitioners, Max France and Larissa Chan, and the responder, uh, respondents, Peter DeRay and Eric Snell. Uh, and today we are arguing the case of Tims versus Indiana. Uh, I turn it over to my colleague from Consorts, Julie Sipper. Thank you, Josh. You always do a wonderful job introducing the teams. And I am here uh, to wish you all luck. And you will be hearing from both of us with questions after you begin. OK. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the petitioners. Uh, you have 15 minutes. You can begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. My name is Max Franz, counsel for the petitioner, Tyson Jim. So today we are asking that this court overturn or abandon its erroneous slaughterhouse decision and proceed to incorporate the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment through the privileges or immunities clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, we believe that the excessive fines clause guarantees a substantive protection rather than a procedural Substantive due process is an illegitimate um, legal philosophy. It contradicts itself. Substance and process have contradictory meanings, noted by um, Justice Thomas, who said in concurrence that substantive due process is, quote, a legal fiction. The notion that a constitutional provision that guarantees only process before a person is deprived of life, liberty, or property could define the substance of those rights strains credulity for even the most casual user of words unquote, from Chicago and McDonald. Um, the 14th Amendment states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Excessive fines is a substantive protection because, because the 8th uh, the Amendment merely states nor excessive fines and posts. Counselor, counselor, sorry to interrupt you, but, but before you, you go into the uh, excessive fines analysis, um, Let's talk more about what you're suggesting, which is uh, that we uh, overturn a case uh, which has been settled for over 150 years. Um, and you are asking us uh, to what it sounded like if substantive due process is erroneous, is that we should reconsider our substantive due process uh, precedent in the past. How do you square that with the uh, principle of stare decisis? Um, stare decisis is not um, to be universally followed. The, the legitimacy of precedent comes from its being right, not from its being old. Um, just because a case has been um, upheld for a long time does not mean that it is correct. It is only, we only use stare decisis because it prevents us from, um, it, it's a matter of efficiency mostly rather than. Uh, Excuse me. Um, so, so, may, so maybe we agree with you uh, on that potentially, but so what are we going to do uh, with that whole line of substantive due process case law that we have? Well, that whole line of substantive due process case law that we have can be, incorpor can be reincorporated using the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. And when, and when, are we, and when would we have the opportunity to do that? Um, right now. Right now, I'm gonna I'm going to overturn all of those decisions. Um, yes, we can. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't need to chuckle, but aren't we only here about Tyson Tim's? How can we reach out to other issues that aren't presented here? Well, if the court, um, that's okay. Okay. Um, you can, the, ask, by the way, you can ask us to do that, but we're going to push back on you a little bit because as a court, we, we tend to not want to do things like that. Um, we can overturn substantive due process decisions in one fell swoop and replace them with um, privileges or immunities because the court can um, 
rule in dictum on matters that are not necessarily central to the case at hand, but with an understanding that that will be interpreted and taken into account in lower court rulings in the future. And the Supreme Court will have to relitigate and re-see some things, but um, ultimately- That's where we were going. Yep. Okay. So, counsel, let's maybe put you on a different track. Tell us why you think Slaughterhouse was wrongly decided. Just walk us through your thing there, please. All right. I think Slaughterhouse was wrongly decided, first and foremost, because it was at odds with the intent of the people who wrote the Fourth Amendment. Representative John Bingham, Republican from Ohio, was the principal drafter of Section 1. Um, in a speech to Congress, he described it as a strong, simple, plain declaration that equal laws and equal and exact justice shall hereafter be secured within every state of the union, unquote, and states that the 14th Amendment, quote, is to apply to other states also that have in their constitutions and laws today provisions in direct violation of every principle of our constitution, unquote. He continues, um, the constitution limits only the action of Congress and is not a limitation on the states. This amendment supplies that defect, which is to say, supplies the defect that the Constitution and its Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. He continues, and allows Congress to correct the unjust legislation of the states so far that the law which operates on one man shall operate equally upon all. He continues, quote, gentlemen, admit the force of provisions in the Bill of Rights that the citizen of the United States shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States in the several states. He seeks to, quote, arm the Congress with the power to enforce the Bill of Rights as it stands in the Constitution, unquote. Um, so, as we can see, Bingham, the principal author of Section 1 of Article 14, intended that it um, incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states. When Senator Jacob Howard introduced the 14th Amendment's final draft to the Senate, he says expressly that um, privileges or immunities refer to, quote, the personal right guaranteed and secured by the first eight amendments of the Constitution. So, first of all, we think that privileges or immunities is more historically well suited based on the intent of its authors to incorporate um, protections from the Bill of Rights than the Due Process Clause. Um, the, due pro the Due Process Clause provides a procedural protection rather than substantive protection. It merely guarantees that none shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It says nothing of uh, substantive protections like the one we're discussing here. Okay, so Counselor, walk me through. Um, we talk about Slaughterhouse. Let's talk about Crookshank for a minute, right? What do you think this court should do with the Crookshank case? Um, refresh me on the central holding of Crookshank. Um, Crookshank decided a few years after Slaughterhouse and it held that the uh, right to bear arms was not a privilege or immunity of citizenship. Well, I would say that that was an erroneous decision then, because the Second Amendment expressly guarantees that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, and that, as Justice um, Thomas argued in concurrence in uh, Chicago McDonald, is a privilege and immunity of citizenship. Well, but Justice Thomas, let's look at McDonald for a minute. Justice Thomas was alone. He, there was no one else who joined him at McDonald. Why should we go down the road that no one's going to Justice Thomas on at McDonald? Well, while no one went with him, I still believe that Justice Thomas was correct um, in rejecting substantive due process in uh, Chicago v. McDonald. I also think that he was correct that the Second Amendment's uh, protection of the right to keep and bear arms is a privilege is a privilege or immunity of citizens of the United States. Okay, we can you can continue. Uh, going back to um, substance, I want to explain why I believe the excessive fines clause is a substantive rather than a procedural protection. The excessive fines clause states nor excessive fines imposed. That is all it states. It does not provide a protection for imposing an excessive fine. The Fourth Amendment, for example, states the right of the people to secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be abolished, shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. Unquote. So the Fourth Amendment provides a procedural protection. In other words, in order to get a search warrant, 
um, and search someone's possessions, papers, and effects, um, the government must first prove that there is probable cause that a crime has been committed. That's a procedural protection. Um, the First Amendment, on the contrary, permit no law respecting the establishment of religion, religion or prohibiting yet as well. Um, that is a substantive protection. That is a full stop. Under no circumstances can the government um, prohibit the free exercise of religion. The excessive fines clause is language that nor excessive fines imposed is the same kind of protection as the First Amendment protection. It's not the kind of protection as the uh, Fourth Amendment protection. Um, So in Hurtado versus California, 1884, um, the majority notes that due process restrictions were, quote, applied in England only as guards against executive usurpation and tyranny, here in this country, have become bulwarks also against arbitrary legislation. This sentence was again quoted in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, and it tracks the way due process has been stretched to include substantive protections. Um, but wait, 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 but, but. Casey was a due process case, and Hurtado was also a due process case. You're arguing about privileges or immunities. Why are these cases helpful for you if you're arguing about privileges or immunities? Um, I'm just trying to illustrate the way in which the due process clause has been stretched beyond its um, literal textual meaning. Well, that, 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 that might be true, but you have to make an affirmative case about why we should use privileges or immunities, right? It's not enough to say that due process is wrong. What, what's your affirmative case that we should PRI, privileges or immunities? Um, well, right now we don't really have an affirmative case for um, using privileges or immunities because as we have said, um, court precedent has gone what I believe is the wrong way for so long against the intent and uh, text of the 14th Amendment. Okay, continue. Uh, so a plain textual reading of the due process clause, um, and this is the meaning used in England that is acknowledged in Hurtado versus California, Plankard versus Casey, means that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without appropriate judicial proceedings. Um, when we use substantive due process to articulate a substantive limit against the government, in other words, something like um, the government shall not abridge the freedom of speech, as was the case in Gitlow versus New York, um, we are betraying the text of the of the Constitution. Um, Corfield versus Coriel presented one view of the privileges and immunities clause of Article Four, Section Two, um, and. The court wrote there that, quote, the rights of a citizen of one state to pass through or to reside in any other state for the purposes of trade, agricultural, profession, or pursuits or otherwise. It continues to list protections um, of that nature, but not protections of the Bill of Rights. However, in Dred Scott v. Sanford, Justice Cheney writes that, quote, the rights and privileges of the citizen were regulated and plainly defined by the Constitution itself, and, quote, before lifting protections of the Bill of Rights among the citizens. He specifically includes free speech, right of petition, free exercise, and immunity from anonymous witnesses, amongst others. Um, so those two cases in antebellum case law presented varying views on um, what the intent of the privileges and immunities clause of Article 4, Section 2 were. And in the absence of an authoritative antebellum definition of uh, privileges and immunities, I think we should defer to the authorial intent of Bingham and others who were involved in the drafting and writing and passage of the 14th Amendment. Okay, you have about a minute and a half left. All right. So to close off here, I would just like to sort of attack the slaughterhouse decision. So. In the Slaughterhouse decision, the majority asks, quote, was it the purpose of the 14th Amendment by the simple declaration that no state should make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States 
It transferred the security and protection of civil rights from the states to the federal government. Was it intended to bring within the power of Congress the entire domain of civil rights heretofore belonging exclusively to the states? Unquote. That's from Slaughterhouse. Um, the court asks whether the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to bring civil rights under the domain of the federal government. Bingham, in a speech to Congress, says that he sought to, quote, arm the Congress with the power to enforce the Bill of Rights as it stands in the Constitution, unquote. Other acts, including the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Military Reconstruction Act, enforcement clauses of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, indicate that it was, in fact, the um, will of the 39th Congress to impose federal power over states as regards civil rights. Um, in Slaughterhouse, however, the majority decides to, quote, draw from the consequences as opposed to the text. Um, striking down Louisiana statute, the majority argues, would make the court, quote, a perpetual censor upon all legislation of the states on the civil rights of the own authority. Okay, counsel, you are, hey, counsel, you're out of time, but thank you very much. Okay, and now the respondent is 15 minutes. You may not begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. My name is Eric Snell, and with my uh, assistant counsel, Peter B. Ray, who will be representing the state of Indiana in this case. As this court has long held, the excessive fines clause is a procedural protection. This court defines an excessive fine in Waters Pierce Oil Company v. Texas, 1909, as a fine, quote, so grossly excessive as to amount to a declaration of property without due process of law. Where the excessive fines was re-examined, this court would still find that it is guaranteed a due process. Federal and local jurisdictions both have well-defined procedures to calculate fines, and hence an unexpected deviation from this due process. The principal argument against incorporation through, through due process lies in the concept of substantive due process. As Justice Thomas writes in Chicago McDonald v. Chicago concurrence, the due process clause has been stretched beyond beyond its original meaning. However, the argument against substantive due process does not apply to this case, as the Eighth Amendment excessive fines clause is a procedural protection rather than a substantive right, and thus fits within the intended narrow scope of due process. Counselor, can you help me understand the, uh, so you're, you're kind of separating out procedural from substantive. Uh, how do we determine which falls into which category? Uh, Your Honor, I think it it falls back to the history of the clause as well as how it's enforced today. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, the um, there are like procedures to see what an appropriate and proportionate fine is. Um, the but United the current, but Counselor, is there presumably there's a procedure <laughs> to determine what uh you know what's in and what's out in terms of freedom of speech right so, so couldn't we really say there's a procedure for all rights there's a procedural dimension how give me a give me help me define a really crisp clear line between the two because i'm not seeing that so far in what you've given me so i think if you look at the phrasing of the united states sentencing commission's guidelines for establishing fines it's very clear that it's based on procedure. Um, the procedure uses formulaic approach to calculate maximum and minimum fines. Um, and it quote, if the base fine is $85,000 and the culpability score is five, the base fine is multiplied by 1.0 to determine the minimum fine and 2.0 to determine the maximum fine, resulting in a guideline fine range of 85000 to $170,000. The counselor, I, I, I still think we're we're on the same point here, right? So you're mm -hmm. you're saying that there is a procedure for determining whether or not a fine is excessive. Yes. That doesn't help me understand whether or not the prohibition on excessive fines is a right that, under your understanding, is procedural rather than substantive. Uh, so it doesn't to me. There doesn't seem to be a clear line between those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely something that Justice Thomas points out in his McDonald v. Chicago concurrence, that as time has gone on, the line between the two has blurred. Um, 
So while that's true, but you're trying to you're trying to help us understand why substantive due process is an appropriate way to incorporate the excessive fines clause here, right? So you're saying it's procedural, um, but I'm pushing back on you to give me a clearer definition than you need. There is a procedure in place to determine that a fine is excessive because you could use that logic to apply to our assessment of really any right, right? Yes. Um, if you look back at the history of the Eighth Amendment Successive Fines Clause, it comes from the 1689 English Bill of Rights, or Declaration of Rights. Um, And in this Declaration of Rights, there were two principal concerns um, that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted, which we recognize as the opinion today. And furthermore, that fines and forfeitures of particular persons before conviction are illegal and void, which is clearly a due process concern, because you have to have the court justify having a fine in the case as if you aren't convicted of the crime clearly there there's no rationale back in yeah, so let me let, let me let me try another another question for you if i can um do you think the slaughterhouse case was correctly decided uh we did not focus on the slaughterhouse case i this is not an appropriate case to overturn the slaughterhouse case as we believe that the excessive fines clause is a due process concern. No, no, I, I, I know that, but but I'm asking you, do you think the slaughterhouse case was correctly decided? I think in terms of a moral issue, as well as simply um, the effect of the case by undermining privileges and immunity, it is correctly decided in that it applies the Bill of Rights to all persons rather than to only citizens. Oh, oh, oh. What what was the holding of the slaughterhouse cases? The holding of the slaughterhouse cases was that the Fourteenth Amendment's privilege of immunities clause does not immediately incorporate all of the Bill of Rights against the states using the privilege of privileges of immunities clause. And, and what about United States versus Crookshank? You know that case? We just, uh, yes. Um, Yeah, um, I, I personally do not believe that that was uh, correctly decided as, as Justice Thomas points out in his McDonald v. Chicago, the right to bear arms is fundamentally different from other rights such as the right against double jeopardy or the, the protection. I, I guess you, you, keep, you keep citing Justice Thomas's concurrent McDonald. Um, that supports the other side, right? Justice Thomas didn't use due process. He used privileges or immunities. Why do you keep looking to Justice Thomas? He 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 says that substantive due process is wrong altogether. I keep looking to Justice Thomas because he creates the differentiation between a due process protection and a substantive right. And as Justice Thomas writes in his United States versus Baha Cajun, which is a, a PC author about an excessive fine, is clearly his concern about the excessive fine comes from from due process, as he wrote that, um, as, as he wrote that the court, the fine was excessive because the court had incorrectly applied the law, um, quote, because instrumentalities historically have been treated as a form of guilty property forfeitable in civil in rem proceedings, it is irrelevant whether the respondent's currency is an instrumentality. The forfeiture is punitive, and the test for its excessiveness involves solely a proportionality determination. In so this is um, that we find the excessive because the law about civil and rem proceedings was incorrectly applied to the case. We furthermore found that the court had not judged mitigating or aggravating factors as, quote, the respondent's actions were, quote, solely a reporting offense, in quote. So Justice Thomas understanding the the key differences between substantive and procedural rights um, 
And looking at his opinion in United States versus Don Cajun, we clearly agree that the um, protection against excessive fines is related to procedure. So as a due process protection, it, the case against substantive due process does not apply in Tennessee, Indiana. And thus, this is not an appropriate case to overturn Waterhouse or any of due process rulings. Okay. Uh, Counselor, can you take us through the due process analysis for this case? Sure. Um, so, as we see with Sorry to See, Sorry, the census in Water Years Oil Company in Texas. As an excessive fine is defined, defined as so grossly excessive as to amount to a deprivation of property without due process of law. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about the United States Sentencing Commission, how it publishes a primer of guidelines for calculating minimum and maximum fines for a certain crime. Um, and then judges consider the aggravating or mitigating factors. And hence, because there's a, a standardized procedure, and this is for, for traffic violations, for felonies, as we see in Tennessee, Indiana, uh, the maximum fine for a traffic felony was $10,000. Um, because there's a well defined procedure, and because of the stare decisis set in, in Water Spears Oil Company and other cases, um, it seems obvious that. That protection against excessive fines is a procedural protection. Proceed, Counselor. And the court also bears the responsibility of considering the effects of its rulings. Um, a key difference lies between the, phrase, the phrasing of the two clauses in the 14th Amendment, as the due process clause refers to any person, whereas the privileges or immunities clause refers to only citizens of the United States. Incorporation into the due process clause would thus extend the, the excessive fines clause to all persons, while the privileges of the this clause would grant protections to only citizens. And because the Eighth Amendment does not include any stipulations about citizenship, incorporation via, via the privileges or immunities clause would create an arbitrary qualification for the protections of the Eighth Amendment. Counselor, Counselor, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is that. <laughs> You basically say there are some cases that fall under substantive due process and others that would be more appropriate under privileges or immunities, right? Yes. Okay, so if that's your argument, now you're bringing up this concern about citizenship because the language is, uh, because of the language in the privileges or immunities uh, clause. How do we square that, right? Are, is it that procedural rights are for everyone and substantive rights are only for citizens? Well, according to the the language of the 14th Amendment, that does seem how it's seem how it's laid out. Um, because the privilege of immunities clause applies to only citizens of the United States. And, and how does that and how do you that square with our previous case law? Um, the court has having incorporated everything through the due process clause rather than privilege of immunities, has essentially gotten around the question of who the, the Bill of Rights applies to. Um, so presumably, you're asking us to careen headlong into that question, though, right? I, I'd like to clarify. I, I, it's not necessarily that, that um, privileges and means would be better suited for some cases. It's that they might be better suited in, in discussion in better cases. As in, this isn't the correct time to talk about that. Uh, that idea that privileges and immunities because that doesn't necessarily apply to this case, whereas it might apply to future cases. That doesn't necessarily. Well, I, I, that that's we we can we can agree that it that we might not have to address that question, but you've brought it up, so I have some. I, I would like you to answer the questions that I'm that I'm asking. Could you repeat the question? Right. So you your uh, teaming uh, co counsel said that there are some rights that fall under sort of procedural due process, right? And others that are more substantive in dimension and therefore are more appropriately analyzed by the privileges or immunities clause. But that, based on your reading, right, of the citizenship provision of the privileges or immunities clause, some rights, right, 
that are substantive only apply to citizens, but procedural rights presumably apply to everyone. How do you square that with our previous case law? Well, it seems um, with previous case law, we see that procedural rights have traditionally applied to everyone, um, such as Miranda rights um, and the rights of the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, whereas rights such as um, the rights to own a gun have only applied to citizens. And, as, and in what case did we decide that? Um, well, under McDonald v. Chicago, they, it applies to everyone because it was incorporated using due process. Okay. And you have about 40 seconds left, Counselor. Um, so, because the other um, due process rights and protections for non citizens, including visa holders, um, apply to everyone equally, it would be strange to. Um, including the other parts of the Eighth Amendment, like uh, the protection against cruel and unusual punishment, it'd be a strange ruling to say that the excessive fines clause in particular only applies to citizens, whereas the rest of the Eighth Amendment and, and the rest of the rights apply to everyone equally. And with this understanding, we ask the court to find that. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, five minutes for rebuttal from the petitioners. Whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start with the excessive fines clause is not or is a procedural protection. <coughs> However, I could, we completely disagree. I think um, you know the excessive fines clause says, um, and no, um, sorry, it, it's it's a black and white question. It says the government cannot. Um, uh, 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 excessively fine a person. It's not it, um, saying that there is a process for this. An example, um, it's if you can compare uh, the excessive fines clause to to free speech. In the case of Gitlin v. New York, it was um, established that free speech is a substantive protection because it's a black and white question. The government cannot abridge free speech. The government cannot excessively fine its uh, citizens and its and persons. Um, uh, however, you know, in, in like the uh, the trial by jury um, of the Sixth Amendment, for example, is a procedural protection. So I think we can draw a line between substantive and procedural protection <coughs> by looking at the text of the Constitution and, and seeing whether the Constitution um, asks a, or presents a black and white question: Is the government um, excessively fining someone? Is it not? Or if, they're, if the Constitution is presenting a process by which the government must fall in order to take away somebody's rights. Um, so again, excessive fines is a substantive protection. And just as my my colleague had pointed out earlier, if um, since the excessive fines clause is a substantive protection, it would have to be sent as with the current law right now. It would have to be protected by substantive due process which, as he said earlier, is quite oxymoronic. I mean, you're combining the word substance and and um, and procedure. It's kind of oh, like... Kind of I mean, again, I, I know as a, as a linguistic matter, it doesn't make much sense, but we have a lot of decades of precedent applying substantive due process. Why should we now get rid of that stuff? Correct. You're correct. We've had it's about 150 years since the Slaughterhouse cases when we took down the Privileges and Immunities Clause. However, just because... We have this president. It's very important to follow president. So yes, the slaughterhouse case was presented um, that we should use the due process clause for incorporation. We can't court. I uh, can't. The court cannot just um, stop following the president set by that case. However, this is the opportunity in this case to to point out why this is wrong. And you know, and and they um, the opposing side said that the slaughterhouse case was. Um, well, first of all, they didn't really acknowledge the slaughterhouse case, but it's a very important and crucial case because it strikes down the privileges and immunities clause. Um, we can't ignore that. Um, the slaughterhouse clearly, as my colleague had pointed out earlier, is against the intent of the 14th Amendment. It's quite heinous for the court to, you know, with all due respect, to ignore these words, to ignore the, the words of the privileges and immunities clause. And so the slaughterhouse case is very important because it 
had the it was an the incorrect decision and um, and it took away the privileges and immunities clause. And so I think it's important here today to establish that the privileges and immunities clause is uh, very important and that the slaughterhouse case is incorrect and that we need to abandon it essentially. Now um, another point that or sorry a second the um, slaughterhouse case also, um, Justice Miller, in the Slaughterhouse case, besides just completely striking down or believing he not to believe in the was because, um, as I quote, he expressed, or sorry, not yet, he expressed. I have, have a minute left, I have a minute left, Counselor. All right. Um, so I just wanted to say that the Privileges and Immunities Clause is the character to incorporate the rights to the states. Um, we have the intent of the, the 14th Amendment by um, shown evidence of the author, Bingham, who wrote the intent of this. Uh, we have the, uh, the contrast and we have the, the contrasting um, messages of the uh, slaughterhouse cases. There is also the, the proof that um, the excessive fines clause is a substantive protection and so therefore should be used um, um, should be incorporated through the Privileges and Immunities Clause because substantive due process is not an appropriate uh, tool to incorporate substantive rights to the states. And as such, we should again abandon Slaughterhouse, nullify the rulings of Slaughterhouse because it's quite egregious that we ignore <coughs> the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Okay, and that, that's time. Okay, we have now five minutes from the respondents' rebuttal. You can do whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. the Court. Uh, the petitioners uh, uh, consistently assert the language of the Eighth Amendment is substantive, and then thus the court should use the privileges to incorporate. However, under both stare decisis and a long standing understanding of the current uh, formulaic nature of fine assessments, the excessive fines clause is procedural. Um, just because uh, just because it says no excessive fines shall be imposed doesn't mean it's not procedural. Because the way we determine excessive fines is to be procedural. Uh, this is supported by Waters Pierce Oil Company versus Texas, Austin versus the United States, and uh, the Baja Asian case, all which consider various procedures that go into assessing a fine. Um, furthermore, federal and local jurisdictions, as we have discussed, uh, go into determining the standardized way to determine the fines. There are outlines that we often consider and that we must consider when determining these fines. And these actually date all the way back um, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, English Bill of Rights when we considered these. There were, there were procedures to understand those fines. Um, in addition- uh, Counselor, could you, could, you, could you just walk me through, did the seizure of Tyson Tim's car violate the Eighth Amendment here, assuming it's incorporated? Uh, yes, yes it did, um, indeed. Uh, um, of course, just because- okay. You're, you're arguing for Indiana. You're assuming that if there's incorporation, then, then Indiana violated Tim's rights? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That because uh, uh, instrument, like, just because the car was used in the crime, uh, the instrumentality is historically have been treated as a form of property uh, for the full and in ram proceedings. But that's irrelevant uh, whether the respondent's currency. Uh, or like car is an instrumentality because the forfeiture is, is punitive and then the excessiveness uh, relates to the proportionality uh, and it's proportionality determination is that proportionality is really uh, excessive. Okay. All right, we continue. Okay, um, the petitioners heavily rely on the idea that the idea of the idea that substantive due process is a uh, legal fiction as stated. Um, however, as we have contended, uh, the Thomas the Thomas concurrence, the petitioner's reference often doesn't apply since the right to keep and bear arms is fundamentally different from the excessive fines clause. The policy itself refers to the excessive fines clause as a procedure, just uh, as representing the majority of our Asian case. Um, indeed, stare decisis uh, isn't an inexorable command, as stated, um, but it's unreasonable to begin overturning more than a century, decades and decades of well established litigation just because it's supposed to be of a single author of the Immunities Clause. That would be ridiculous. Um, because we must consider the consequences of doing so. Incorporation uh, via the Privileged Immunities Clause would only grant excessive fines protection from citizens, which hypothetically. Um,
uh, which, which would pretty much allow people who are non-citizens to, to be deprived of property uh, unilaterally, which, which is just unreasonable to expect. This, we must we must use the due process clause in this instance. Uh, although it may be considered due to privilege and use clause uh, in future cases, uh, for now, the due process clause is the best way to go. Um, uh, just considering historical precedent, uh, litigation, um, uh, and the, the consequences of an alternative route in this specific situation. Okay, you have about a minute left, Counselor. Okay. Um, this court defines an excessive fine as so grossly excessive uh, as to amount to a deprivation of property without due process of law. We've established that in Waters Pierce Oil Company. This understanding that it's a procedural protection is supported by precedent, historical origins of the clause, uh, and an examination of the procedures by which fines are determined. The central argument against incorporation lies in the idea that due process has been stretched beyond its original intent. That is applied in this case. Um, because this fits in, this fits in with the narrow, uh, the narrow intended scope of due process clause. Uh, incorporation through privileged communities would thus create contradictory, confusing standards. Um, by only extending uh, excessive fines clause protection uh, to citizens, habeas corpus, Miranda rights, and a ton of other rights uh, all apply to uh, all people. Hence, ruling that only citizens could enjoy these protections against excessive fines would be inconsistent and untenable. Uh, ruling that non-citizens are protected by some parts of the Eighth Amendment, but not others, uh, despite the amendment itself having a mention, no mention or a stipulation of citizenship, would be contradictory. Uh, this court, to agree with stare decisis and establish logical and consistent law, should it incorporate the excessive fines clause using the first process. Okay, and that's and that's a wrap. Okay, thank you so much. And that brings a conclusion to this round of the tournament. This is a final match. Uh, I am very proud of all of you. You did a wonderful job. These are not easy cases, not easy questions. Uh, we give you these questions, try and see you think, and you're very, very good. You should be very proud of yourselves. Uh, we will announce the results probably the next week or so, uh, but no matter what happens, good job, congratulations, and I wish all of you the best of luck for the future. Uh, Julie? Congratulations to all of you, and where is your fabulous uh, coach and teacher? <laughs> Yeah, Gary, come over here. Garrett, get over here. Congratulations to you, my friend, because I you always have uh, teams who make it to this round in the competition, but I don't think we've ever had this many of your teams. Um, <laughs> and that also, by the way, doesn't even include the people who didn't who submitted from your classes who didn't make it to this round. So you're extraordinary. You should get a round of applause. And you sat here all day on this Saturday. So just a big shout out to you and congratulations to you and your students for your robust participation uh, in this competition. Uh, and uh, for us, it's just always such a joy uh, to see uh, how well the students perform grappling with, you know, very complex legal issues. And I think one of the most rewarding things is seeing the same coaches come back year after year and to bring such strong teams into the competition. So thank you. Well, oh, thank you. And uh, you guys, uh, five hours long, that's a long day. You are exhausted. Long day for you uh, too, friend. <laughs> and with that, let us all go enjoy our Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. With that, thank you so much.